Now, Sir Frederick Kenyon says, besides recording varieties of reading, tradition, or conjecture, the Masoretes undertook a number of calculations which do not enter into the ordinary sphere of textual criticism. They number they numbered the verses, words, and letters of every book. They calculated the middle word in the middle of each. The enumerated verses which contained all the letters of the alphabet, or a certain number of them, and so on. These trivialities, as we may, we may rightly consider them, had yet the effect of securing minute attention to the precise transmission of the text. That's why it, is, it was done so well. And they are but an excessive manifestation of a respect for the sacred scriptures. I don't like the word excessive, but they needed manifestation of, but he says excessive, of a respect for the sacred scriptures, which in itself deserves nothing but praise because of the marvelous, marvelous record of transmission throughout the years, the centuries. The Masoretes were indeed anxious that not one jot or tittle, not one smallest letter, or not, nor one tiny part of a letter of the law should pass away or be lost. A factor that runs throughout the above discussion of the Hebrew manuscript evidence says is the Jewish reverence for the scriptures. With respect to the Jewish scriptures, however, it was not scribal accuracy alone that guaranteed their product. Rather, he was all, their almost superstitious reverence for the Bible. I don't know, that's questionable. Whatever they did is what they did. You can describe it in an imperfect way. Uh, it's irrelevant. According to the Talmud, there were specifications not only for the kind of skins to be used and size of the columns, but the scribes the scribe was even required to perform a religious ritual before writing the name of God. Rules governed this, the kind of ink used. I don't know if this is superstitious. This is complying with the rules. Dictated the spacing of words and prohibited wording. A wording. O-R-D. Wording anything from memory. The lines and even the letters were counted methodically. If a manuscript was found to contain even one mistake, it was discarded and destroyed. This is not superstition. These are following the rules. The scribal formalism was responsible, at least in part, <clears throat> for the extreme care exercised in copying the scriptures. It was also for this reason that there were only a few manuscripts because the rules demanded the destruction of defective copies. Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian for the Romans, first century, writes, <coughs> writes, We have given practical proof of our reverence for our own scriptures. For, although such a long ages have now passed, no one has ventured either to add or to remove or to alter a syllable, and it is an instinct with every Jew from the day of his birth to regard them as the decrees of God, to abide by them, and, if need be, cheerfully to die for them. Time and again, ere now, ere now, the sight has been witnessed of prisoners enduring tortures and death in every form in the theaters, rather than utter a single word against the laws and the allied documents. Josephus continues by making a comparison between the Hebrew respect for scripture and the Greek regard for their literature. What Greek, what Greek would endure as much as for the same cause? Even to save the entire collection of his nation's writings from destruction, he would not face the smallest personal injury. For the Greeks, they are mere stories and improvised according to the fancy of their authors. And in this estimate, even of the older historians, they are quite justified. When they see some of their own manuscript contemporaries venturing to describe events in which they bore no part without taking the trouble to seek information from those who know the facts. By Josephus. Still, however, the earliest Masoretic manuscripts in existence dated from about A.D. 1000 and later awaited confirmation of their accuracy. 
That confirmation came with an astounding discovery off the shores of Israel's Dead Sea. I would ask the question, I've asked this many times, what has the Dead Sea Scrolls revealed about the Old Testament Scriptures? Nothing new. They're as if they were written the next day. It's amazing. Amazing. Very, very, very few uh, errors or discrepancies. So we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. The big question was asked first by Sir Frederick Kenyon. Capitalize the F here. Does this Hebrew text, which we call Masoretic, and which we have shown to descend from a text drawn up from A.D. 100, faithfully represent the Hebrew text as originally written by the authors of the Old Testament books? That's nearly a thousand years before the earliest Hebrew manuscript we had before. Before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the question was, how accurate are the copies we have today compared to the copies of the first century and earlier? The earliest complete copy of old, the Old Testament dates from the 10th century. Thus, the big question, because the text has been copied over many times, can we trust it? A thousand years? The Dead Sea Scrolls provide an astounding discovery in an answer. The scrolls are made up of some 40,000 inscribed fragment, fragments. From these fragments, more than 500 books have been reconstructed. Many extra-biblical books and fragments were discovered that shed light on the 2nd century BC to 1st century AD religious community of Qumran on the shores of the Dead Sea. Such writings as the Zadokite documents and Rule of the community and the manual of discipline help us to understand the purpose of daily Qumran life. In the various caves are some very helpful commentaries on the scriptures, but the most important documents of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls are copies of the Old Testament text dating from more than a century before the birth of Christ. So how were the Dead Sea Scrolls found? interesting account, Ralph Early gives a, a vivid and concise answer uh, to how the scrolls were found by sharing an account showing God's providential care. The story of this discovery is one of the most fascinating tales of modern times. In February or March of 1947, a Bedouin shepherd boy named Muhammad was searching for a lost goat. He tossed a stone into a hole in a cliff on the west side of the Dead Sea, about eight miles south of Jericho. To his surprise, he heard the sound of shattering pottery. Investigating, he discovered an amazing sight. On the floor of the cave <laughs> were several large jars containing leather scrolls wrapped in linen cloth. Because the jars were carefully sealed, the scrolls had been preserved in excellent condition for nearly 1,900 years. They were evidently placed there in A.D. 68. Five of the scrolls found in Dead Sea Cave 1, as it is now called, were brought by the Archbishop of the Syrian Orthodox Monastery at Jerusalem. Meanwhile, three other scrolls were purchased by Professor Sukhanik of the Hebrew University there. When the scrolls were first discovered, no publicity was given to them. In November of 1947, two days after Professor Sukhanik purchased three scrolls and two jars from the cave, he wrote in his diary, it may be that this is one of the greatest finds ever made in Palestine, <clears throat> a find we never so much as hoped for, but these significant words were not published at the time. Fortunately, February 1948, the Archbishop, who could not read Hebrew, phoned the American School of Oriental Research in Jerusalem and told about the scroll scrolls. By good providence, the acting director of the school at the moment was a young scholar named John Trevor, who was also an excellent amateur photographer. With arduous, dedicated labor, he photographed each column of the great Isaiah scroll, which is 24 feet long and 10 inches high. He developed the plates himself and sent a few prints by airmail to Dr. W.F. Albright of Johns Hopkins University, 
who is widely recognized as the Dean of American Biblical Archaeologists. By return airmail, Albright wrote, my heartiest congratulations on the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. What an absolutely incredible find. And there can happily not be the slightest doubt in the world about the genuineness of the manuscript. He dates it about 100 BC. All right, we have the value of the scrolls. Move it up a little bit. The oldest complete Hebrew manuscript we possessed before the Dead Sea Scrolls were from AD 900 on. How could we be sure of their accurate transmission since before the time of Christ in the first century AD? <coughs> Thanks to archaeology and the Dead Sea Scrolls we now know. One of the scrolls in the Dead Sea Caves was a complete MS of the Hebrew text of Isaiah. It is dated by paleographers around 125 BC. This MS is more than 1,000 years older than any MS we previously possessed. Amazing, more than 1,000 years. The significance of this discovery has to do with the detailed closeness of the Isaiah scroll, 125 BC, to the Masoretic text of Isaiah, AD 916, 1,000 years later. It demonstrates the unusual accuracy of the copyists of the scripture over a thousand year period. Of the 166 words in Isaiah 53, there are only 17 letters in question. Ten of these letters are simply a matter of spelling, which does not affect the sense. Four more letters, four letters only, are minor stylistic changes such as conjunctions. The remaining three letters comprise the word light, which is added in verse 11 and does not affect the meaning greatly. Furthermore, this word is supported by the Septuagint, IQIS, uh, manuscript. Thus, in one chapter of 166 words, there's only one word, and this word does not significantly change the meaning of the passage. Amazing. Gleason Archer states that the Isaiah copies of the Qumran community proved to be word for word identical with our standard Hebrew Bible in more than 95% of the text. The 5% of the variation consisted chiefly of obvious slips of the pen and variations in spelling. Hardly anything to write home about. Or actually something to write home about. Guess what? Miller Burroughs concludes, it is a matter of wonder that through something like a thousand years the text underwent so little alteration. As I said in my first article on the scroll, herein lies its chief importance supporting the fidelity of the Masoretic tradition. What did the scrolls contain? It will not be possible here to survey the more than 800 manuscripts represented by the scrolls. The following is a sampling and fix that of the texts that have been studied for the last 40 years at the point of this article, including most of the older works on which the scrolls were based and the recently published texts from cave form. These texts can be grouped in categories, biblical texts, biblical commentaries, sectarian texts, and pseudographical texts, apoloptic, ec, apocalyptic, well, sorry about that, apocalyptic texts, and mystical or ritual texts, ritualistic texts. Because we're only looking about the Bible itself, the Old Testament. Dead Sea Scroll Discoveries. <clears throat> Cave 1 was discovered by the Arab shepherd boy. From it, he took seven more or less complete scrolls and some fragments. Isaiah A, St. Mark's Monastery Isaiah Scroll, is a popular copy with numerous corrections above the line in the, mar of, in the margin. It is the earliest known copy of any complete book of the Bible. Isaiah B, Hebrew University of Isaiah is incomplete, but its text agrees more closely with the Masoretic text than does Isaiah A. Other cave one fragments. This cave also yielded fragments of Genesis, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Judges, Samuel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Psalms, and some non-biblical works, including Enoch, Sayings of Moses, previously unknown, Book of Jubilee, Book of Noah. Let me fix that. Testament of Levi, Tobit, and the Wisdom of Solomon. An interesting fragment of David containing 
David 2.4, where the language can change from Hebrew to Aramaic, uh, 